I want to tell you a story. And the first story is about a rabbi who every week gets up to do his sermon at the same time. And he sees a man who comes and sits in the second row. And he immediately, before the sermon starts, falls asleep. And the rabbi says after a while, you know, maybe I should approach him and ask him. And on the seventh Shabbat, he comes up, up to him. He says, Mr. Silverman, he says, how come every Shabbat, right before I'm going to give my sermon, you fall asleep? And the man says, Rabbi, I have great faith in you. <laughs> so it's early enough that hopefully you won't sleep. I want to tell you another story. And the story is from ancient Greece. It's a story of a time, the beginning of the Olympics, when someone would light one torch. And we know that they would take that flame, and it was the origin of the marathon. They would run with that flame lit from one city to the next, from Athens to Thebes to Corinth. And that's how the games were passed and how they began. So imagine that there was this runner one time, and he has this torch in his hand, and he's running, and he says, you know, last year I made it four-hour mark. And he's running, and he's running, and he's running, and he's running. And he realizes he's making better time than ever breakneck speed. And suddenly, halfway through the run, he realizes that he looks up, and the torch has gone out. But he realizes he's making great time. So he says, you know, what the heck? I'm just going to run anyway. Let's see if I can still make my time. And he does it. And he arrives in Corinth in breakneck speed in record time, but the flame is no longer lit. And I think sometimes that's our story. Sometimes we're running at breakneck speed, but we haven't realized that the flame is going out in our hearts and in our minds and in our realizations of our lives. Sometimes we're the ones who have the goal of achieving and arriving rather than realizing and being. We're so busy being human doers rather than human beings. If you live in the 21st century, in this country at least, you know that the common answer to the question, how are you? is no longer, I'm fine. That's what I grew up on. People would say, I'm fine. What do they say? Busy, crazy busy. The person could be four years old, 96, 54. Everybody's answer is busy, crazy busy. And now we have a response to that, which is to say it's kind of a compliment to say, hey, it's better than the alternative. Maybe we laugh because we've said it or had it said to us. Kids are busy. Kids are scheduled every moment of their lives in school, out of school, so that they won't have a moment to think, breathe, speculate, look up at a ceiling or at a sky. And we do the same. Speak to a retired person. And you'll ask them, did you think this time of life was going to be slow? Has it turned out to be slow? And they'll say, slow? I've never been busier in my life. And speak to a mom of young kids and ask her about her day. And she said, you know, I need to go to the dentist. And I need to go to the orthodontist. I need to take the nine kids to their nine classes. And I need to get one to water basket weaving and one to basket weaving above water. I need to get another one to ballet and another one to tap and another one to another. She says, did I say nine kids? I just have two. <laughs> All of us are so adept at running that we never bother to turn off. And we come to these moments or more challenging moments that remind us that we have to turn off before we're turned off. Before the system cuts our line off, we have to realize that it is precious and it is ours. Before the network no longer gives us a signal, we have to realize that we have to care for that flame, that signal of life that's in us, that's the realization of what's about us and around us. So we come to these holy days, and we realize that we stopped. What we've done in one hour is nothing. We've sat, and we've read, and we've breathed, and we've sung, and we've put our arms around each other, and we've stood up and sat again. And that's the sum total of what might be one of the most important hours of our lives that comes once a year, stopping, resting, receiving, and not giving, not doing but being. There's a story of a science teacher who gets in front of her class, and she holds up a little bottle or a cup of water. And she says, who can tell me how much this weighs? And one person says four ounces, seven ounces, nine ounces. 
She looks on the bottle, she says 12 ounces. She says, if I hold this glass up, this bottle up, for one minute, there's no problem. She said, if I hold it up for an hour, I'll be in pain. If I hold it up for a day, I'll be hospitalized. And that's what we do with our stress, with our lives. We hold that glass and never realize the Jewish imperative, the human imperative of putting it down, and then realizing how much more endurance we have when we stop before we start again. Elie Wiesel said, man's greatest gift isn't beginning, it's having the capacity to begin again. And our tradition says begin once and then begin again and then begin again and begin again. And every time you stop, realize what has been created so you can begin again in recreating your life, yourself. On Shabbat, on Friday night, we know that we have a longer kiddush, as you'll hear tonight. Instead of simply thanking God for the fruit of the vine, the grapes, we speak of breshit, of creation. And then we speak of Yetziat Mitzrayim, the exodus from Egypt. So we understand if we're holding grape juice or wine, why we'll thank God for grape juice. But why on the Sabbath is there a link between creation, rest, Shabbat, and freedom? And the rabbis and the tradition teach us because the ultimate freedom is not doing. What was it to be enslaved? It wasn't to own time. It wasn't to have that extraordinary gift of dominion over time. And on Shabbat, what we regain is dominion over time. What you have recaptured in an hour and six minutes, or an hour and 36 minutes, is the realization that you can enjoy time and realize time and experience time and cherish time and not just do what we so often do, which is kill time and waste time. The time gives us this vessel for introspection. The time gives us the capacity to breathe and realize the miraculous in us and around us. The time is this extraordinary wonder for which we say Shehechian. We thank God for giving us this ultimate vessel in which we get to experience the fullness of life. On Shabbat, we realize the Sabbath in the absence of doing, which is an extraordinary thing to think about. That what we do is we create Shabbat in empty space. We don't have Shabbat by doing. There are 39 prohibitions of the Sabbath, 39 things that we don't do which create a space for being and not doing. Isn't that an amazing idea? Rather than saying, here's what you do to find yourself, we say, this is what you don't do, and therefore you will, within that, find yourself. And what we find in that is the greatest things are blurry when we rush through them. Life health, love, relationships, the preciousness of people, the preciousness of realizing who we are, that we are capable people, capable of growing and being and loving and striving and realizing something in ourselves that was our capacity that's hidden and hinder when we're constantly running and occasionally looking up to guard the flame. That science teacher taught us something that maybe the rabbis taught us millennia ago, and maybe in Genesis we learned in the first chapter, that there's a cycle of doing, and there's a cycle of stopping, and there's a cycle of re-entering, and a cycle of exiting that we find in the natural world, but we so often supersede it with our desires and our wants. I remember when I was a kid that not doing Turning off wasn't an iPhone because I didn't have an iPhone. There weren't iPhones. The only smart things were people. <laughs> apples were apples. Phones were phones. You could wrap them around the corner and try and get in the bathroom for a private conversation. Then it would swing back and hit your mom. It was no longer private. But what I realized then when I was a boy and we would visit my grandparents' house in a little town called Tivon, Kiryat Tivon in Israel, was that in the afternoon at about 3 or 4 o'clock, you'd go by all the little shops. It wasn't Costco. It was little shops with little wooden doors. And the shopkeeper had on the door a little sign on a chain, and it said, closed. Can you imagine? Closed at 3? Closed at anything with the number 3 in it? Closed from 3 to 5, not 305? And as you know, I go back to Israel regularly with you, and those little signs are gone. 
the quiet of the street between three and five or four and five, whatever those times were when I was a child have given way to more productivity and more, in theory, joy of gain, of profit. But what did it mean to have quiet? What did it mean for kids to whisper and not play in the streets for hours at a time? It meant that there was a balance. It meant there was a respect. It meant there was a relationship between us and time. It meant that people realized that even more money, more valuable than earning something of value was realizing value in that greatest value that we have, which is life and time. So now I look to us and I realize that all of us have this race toward the future. We live in a world that's constantly changing and we come to this place and the imperative here of this story of Rosh Hashanah is to realize who we were in time one year. But isn't that beautiful that the rabbi said, don't look back on your whole life. Look back on one year, a microcosm of who you are. Don't look back on the sins when you were 12 years old unless they're still haunting you at 35. But look back on one year and look to the people around you or the people you need to call or journey to and realize in that year the challenges that you've made to relationships, the crucial conversations that you didn't have. Isn't that a beautiful thing to look back at time as a vessel for choices and relationships and to see that what it's offering us in a new year is the ability to look back so that we can walk forward with clarity, with a lightness of shoulder, with an apology and a word of forgiveness, with a lighter breath, with the ability to realize the precious and the holy in a day, and in a smile, and in an embrace, and in the words, I love you. In Genesis chapter 29, there's something poetic and beautiful. Jacob is journeying toward a goal, Haran. Haran is a place. And he's on this journey, and it's one night that something extraordinary, mystical happens. Jacob lays down a stone on the ground, and he puts his head on the stone, and he sleeps. And it's in that transition, in that seemingly meaningless, non-productive time of sleep and wakening, in that liminal moment in life, that Jacob wakes up, and I imagine he might even have tears in his eyes, when he says, God was in this place, and I did not see it. Imagine what that is at any age in life to wake up to the realization that there was holy potential and holiness in moments of life, but we let them go because we were so busy breaking time and making time and wasting time and killing time. And all we've been given is time as this gift from God. I think before the Baruch Hu, that we bend our knees and we bow, we thank God for the gift of life. But what does it really mean to be that grateful for life when all we have is life? How can the artist be grateful for a canvas when all it is is a platform for his creativity? But what I want to suggest you do in those moments is touch two fingers to the left hand or the neck and realize that what we've been given is indefinite time, a measure, a marker, a reminder. And imagine that when you were born, there was something extraordinary that doesn't happen in the world that we've created, but only in the world that God created. That you, as a tiny being, came into this world and were disconnected from the source of your electricity, electricity which was your mother, and you kept ticking, like a Timex watch. And today, you still have this extraordinary gift that scientists and cardiologists can't explain. They know how it works and they know how it doesn't work, but no one understands the origin of that tick that began you as a matter in time. And no one understands why it sustains us today. What happens when we stop? Listen to the prefixes. Renewal. Rebirth. Realization. Reinforcement. Recognition. Re-ensoulment. We come back to something that we lost. We come back in these holidays and in these holy moments to what we had and lost because when we arrived at our feet, we began to walk and then to run. What happens when we stop? 
we realize what we were and what we can be. These holy days ask us constantly to look back over that bridge at what was and what we did and what we were and what we lost, and to look forward and ask ourselves as we journey forward, what is so precious that we will choose to make it the priority of a given moment? There's a story about an ambitious man who hires guides in Africa on safari. And every morning he gets up, and he gets the guides up. He gets all the guides up. They're sitting, sipping coffee. He says, come on, let's go. I want to get out there. I want to see the game. Let's get ahead of the herd. And, of course, they jump into place, and they run with him, and they catch up with him, and they run to see the game that day. And then the next day, the same thing. Come on, guys, let's go. I'm paying you. Let's get up earlier than yesterday so we can get ahead of the game. And finally, on the fourth day of this, he sees his guides, and he comes to them in the morning, and he says, let's go. And they sit and they sip their coffee. And they look at him and they go, no. And the head guide walks up to his client. And he says, sir, for four days we've been journeying here with you. And every single morning you've been waking us up to go faster and faster and faster. Now we have to stop just to let our souls catch up with us. It's the man holding the torch as he ran from Thebes to Corinth, from Athens to Thebes, from Reseda to Tarzana, from one stage and age in her life to another, running to fulfill this destiny that seems to be about fullness and never seems to allow for gazing and wondering. And yet we think of Archimedes and we think of Newton and we think of Einstein and we realize that their greatest realizations that impacted our lives and our knowledge of the world happened when they weren't doing but when they were dreaming or lying under a tree. So this is our new year. And as we end this evening's service together, let's embark on a new concept of who we can be in relation to time. And what it might mean to turn something off that the manufacturer put in but didn't detail, which was an off switch. Top right corner, if you press it hard enough, it turns off. But how often do we turn it off? How often do we stop and listen fully, not only to those around us, but to a voice within ourselves that might give us the greatest wisdom of this moment? How often do we realize that in silence and holiness, people in ancient days heard a voice that they called God? And that as the world speeds up and we run toward it, Sometimes we need to stop and realize that goodness and mercy follow us all the days of our lives. We just need to stop to let them catch up. Shana Tova.